No, I didn't write the scripts in advance. So I, I, I read, uh, I wrote, I wrote scene ideas primarily, and we'd start and we'd, we'd shoot whatever I could. I, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd come in, I'd say, right, we're doing this, we're doing that, and then, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd uh, then I'd go and dream a bit more and come up with stuff. So it was, a, it was a very organic process. I think it's a very uh, brave and forward-thinking piece of writing which I did at the time, I still do now. I don't think I'm rewriting the Bible with Dark Place, but I am adding an addendum. Well, all he was trying to achieve, basically, was to put down on celluloid what he'd been trying for various years before and to put down, you know, on paper. Um, he has a very distinctive s style, you see. That's what, you know, got me thinking, you know, it could be quite good because, you know, if he can do what he did within the books, you know, in film, you know, then you possibly might have something fairly, you know, fairly new to say. And uh, I still, you know, think that's probably the case. Nobody writes books like Garth Marenghi. Nobody. Ahmed had financed films before. He was interested in motion pictures himself and the moving image. Um, and I persuaded him that this was a worthwhile artistic endeavour. And what happened to him? Because... Ahmed very, very sadly dies. Um, he was shot dead in his flat. I was actually led to believe The Dark Place was going to be a film. Um, from the outset, it's only when arguments ensued between various other cast members and things, it was cut up into so many um, episodes. I think it probably would have benefited from being, you know, a full sort of feature. But what can you do? But, I mean, according to reports, the f if it were to have been a feature film, it would have run at seven hours. Would it have been that long? Good heavens. We see, now that's too long. Two and a half, I think, is most of well, no, not even that. Um, yeah, well, that, obviously that's a problem. Better off as a TV series, then. Can't always be right. The main problem was that we made this show, and I, I forgive me for not telling you this up front when we hired you, but we made this show without any channel's permission. So I just started making the show with Garth, paying for it myself, and <coughs> we didn't know you had to be asked. So we made it, gave it to the channel, and they said... I'm sorry, we didn't ask you to make this. I said, what do you mean you didn't ask us to make this? How, you know, do you ask everyone before they make a show? And they said, yes, we do. And I went, this is news to me, sweetheart. I made this show with my sweat and blood. I spent the last four weeks of my life making this show. Do you want it? No, they say. So I'm, you know, caught between the devil and the deep blue sea, having to sell... 40 episodes of a medical-based horror show um, with no one buying it. That's why we had to put it out in Peru. Thank God for the Peruvian market. Douglas, uh, first and foremost, I wanted Douglas to be every man. I wanted him to be everything that an audience member would want to be, um, would aspire to be, had been in the past. It had to be Johnny Average. It had to be your average Daily Mail reader. In many ways, he is an extension of my own natural abilities. He's, you know, he's, he's got a little bit more than me. He is a little more tragic than I am as a character. Um, he's seen the dark side um, a little too much. Rick Douglas travels in a golf cart around the hospital corridors. Now, I know that some people will say doctors don't really do that. Well, it depends. If you go to a private hospital and you, and you, you, know, you ask for it, you'll get it. I like to think if I was a doctor, I'd probably soup up all my implements. I think, I, you know, I, I wouldn't wear a white lab coat, I don't think. I'd wear a leather one. Sanchez is... Uh, uh a really complex guy. I mean, he's been in the Falklands. You know, he's seen some serious stuff. 
um, super glued men together, that, you know, that type of thing, you know, the type of thing that, that you and I will never see. You know, so you've got to give respect to these, you know, these kind of characters, which I hope I did. One Track Lover was written with Garth falling in love with a broccoli woman. Anyway, from what I remember, he had to be out of town to do something. Something with his wife, I can't remember what it was. So therefore, there wasn't any time, you know, to... F so I did it. That's all it was. Otherwise, it would have been him. So no, there was no, you know, kind of, you know, letting... You know, letting us see, you know, the different sides, you know, to Dr. Sanchez. Sanchez was, you know, just going to be just this down the line. Surgeon didn't take any shit, you know, did what he want. You know, if he wanted to operate that day, he did. If he didn't, he didn't. Um, that was pretty much how it ran. So that's why I fell in love, you know, with a broccoli woman. I believe it's a very good episode. The main sort of focus of the end of the episode, of the um, Broccoli episode, Sanchez loses, you know, his old chap because he's laid down with a broccoli woman. I mean, it is, for instance, if you imagine somebody like Jean-Michel Jarre losing their hands. Im we can only imagine what that would be like. I played Reed as a slightly dishevelled boss anyway. Um, he was a man who was trying to deal with maverick doctors. I mean, Sanchez and Douglas are maverick doctors. They're great doctors, but they do doctoring their way. Um, and Reed has to contend with that. He's got a hospital to run. He's got one ton on his back 24-7. You know, he's got the third floor to contend with. And, um, you know, he used to be one of the best surgeons on the wing. But um, he uh, lost a knee in Korea, and so he can't operate anymore. I thought he lost a bullock in Korea. Yeah, he had a bad time in Korea. He lost a knee and a ball. There was a lot of trouble because Dean wore boots as well. And partly why I bought the boot was to kind of raise my height a little. As you know, I am... I wouldn't say significantly, but I suppose I am, to and any bystander, a little bit shorter than Dean. Um, but Dean would deliberately buy bigger heeled boots to make me look smaller on set. So then I would buy a, a boot with a bigger heel to up the ante. And then it became this really rather ridiculous boot war, which never really ended. And there were a lot of casualties, and it was a sorry business, and it was stupid and crazy, and it went on for five years. He wears those ridiculous cowboy boots to make him slightly taller. I never understand men that do that. I think Tony Blair does that, lifts their cord. These hugely arrogant, stupid men, they're as bad as fucking toupees. They wear these lifts to make themselves an inch higher than they already are. If you're small, you're small. I think anyone gives a shit if you're five foot or five foot one. You know what I mean? With a, with a lift on your shoe. You're still a short man. Unbelievable what people do. And I believe he's still doing that. He's still wearing cowboy boots now with built-up heels. Fantastic stuff. Always makes me snigger. Well, he's gone on record as saying that you're a good foot shorter than him. <laughs> really? How tall does he think he is, then? Answer that. I'm nearly six foot. And Dean is, I think, six foot two, something like that. <laughs> he says he's six foot. Garth Marenga, six foot tall. He's barely five foot and wears lifts. End of story. There are a lot of guns in this show. Do you think that's realistic for life in a hospital, Todd? Um, is there a lot of guns? I think... I don't remember... I don't particularly remember using a gun that often. I don't think there are guns used in hospitals in this country, though I think that there should be. If I was a doctor in this day and age, I would definitely be carrying a gun. Saturday night in um, casualty, you get all kinds of people. Most of them are pissed. Uh, and they don't recognise that you're actually there to help them. You see, so they can, you know, all these sort of situations, you know, can then flare up. And if you just flash a bit of steel, I think, uh, you know, it would soon sort out the men from the boys. Have you used a gun, personally? Yeah, I have used a gun. There are certain certain times when one is backed into a one is backed into a corner, 
where the only way of getting out of that particular corner is with a gun. What sort of That's gun? That's life, isn't it? That's what I found. Do you use guns as well? If I had to, I'd use a gun. I've not had to shoot anyone in the face as yet, but I, I would happily... I'd shoot you in the face if I had to. Him. I mean, I'd try not to, but if I had to, I'd shoot you in the face. The state of the NHS at the moment, you don't know who you're treating half the time. I've seen... I've Honestly, when I was in, when I was in um, the hospital last year, my mother was in there, and I'm not, I shit you not, there were a couple curtains round in that very ward. And the nurse came by and said, happens all the time. And if you'd been a doctor, you would have shot them? If, I, if, if I'd been a doctor in that situation, I would certainly have pulled out my gun and ordered them to halt. If you came into my car, for instance, OK, um, demanded that I got out of my car so you could have my car, now, this, this kind of thing you know, does go on. It goes on in this country now. Mm. I, could, I should be able to kill you for that, OK? Shoot you dead in my own car for telling me to get out of my car so you can take it. But you'd be in, you'd be in the shit, you know. You'd be up against, you know, the judge gripping the oak. The guy that they got to be raped by the eye hadn't seen any photographs, didn't know what was going on, didn't know what would be asked of him. He was just, you know, some extra that was told he had to lie in a bed all day. So, of course, he's going to say yes. And then they bought this bloody great thing with this, I don't know, dwarf chap inside with this cock that was coming up and down like behind this poor boy. And, yeah, you know, he got a bit, uh, you know, he got a bit upset about that. I've seen it. It makes me laugh. I think it's very, very well done. Uh, you don't find it chilling, then? Chilling? The idea is chilling. Oh, yes. But, um... No, I mean, because the thing is, I was there while it was being filmed, you see, and it was, uh, it was rather a hoot for me. Garth didn't find it at all funny. He took, you know, the whole thing very, very seriously. I have a problem with your word bugger there, OK? The man was impregnated to death in my book. Stuart and Kim were carpenters slash builders. They put in a decent performance, decent little performance as well. Harrison Ford was a carpenter. As far as I'm concerned, Harrison Ford is still a carpenter. But, um, you know, he's done very well on it. Okay. He looks like he's always just about to fit a joist, as far as I'm concerned. That guy is on auto cruise. Harrison Ford is on auto cruise. I wish he'd just get it into fourth gear once in a while. And, of course, Jesus was a carpenter. Jesus, also, another great carpenter. I don't know whether he was a good carpenter, but his eye wasn't really on the job from the age of uh, 27 up. He had, other, he had bigger fish to fry, literally bigger fish to fry. Um, but it just shows that woodwork is a good grounding for whatever profession you end up going into. Graham is very, very tall. It's very difficult to act with somebody that tall unless, I suppose, you're doing something like science fiction, you know, where he can play... I don't know, an alien or something. Normal BBC drama, you know, there's nowhere for him. He can't really play a lead. I mean, now, what kind of leading lady is going to be doing that all the time? You know, a leading man with him the whole time. No, it's ridiculous. Dean's very tall, but nowhere near as tall as Graham. Graham's a giant. Garth's direction pretty much consisted of, can you be here at half past nine? Um, there's no cab or anything. Um, probably best you bring something to eat also. That's true as well. I've not made that up. Absolutely true. Did he ever mention your performance? Well, he just said he liked certain bits. I mean, he pretty much, you know, left me to my own devices, I think. He knew I could do it. You know, he had many other things to worry about. So did Dean. Was it true that Garth has a habit of muttering no to himself when someone was doing a take? Yeah, he does, yeah. I sent a memo out, did I not? Because mm. you and I drafted it together. A memo was sent out, first week pre-production, saying, point out to everyone concerned, cast and crew, that Garth Marenghi, the director of this project, will be speaking at twice the speed that he usually does when directing people on set. He would 
pretty much shoot everybody else's scene at the end of the day. So there was a certain rush, which meant you had to get them done. So you just got one take at them. Whereas if a scene involved himself, that would be done, you know, near enough first thing. So, you know, he got about four or five, you know, four or five goes at it. Which I can understand, you know, his cash, fair enough. You're not popular on set, are you? Go on. Garth bollocked the sound man because he said the mic was putting him off acting. And he said, get that thing away from me. And the sound man said, well, if I do get that thing away from you, we won't be able to hear you. And Garth said that wasn't his problem. That was the sound man's problem. That if he couldn't mic him up on the other side of the room, then he would go looking for another sound man. The thing with crew is that they do insist on getting paid. They're not artists. They insist on money. I said, you will have your bunts at the end of the week, cash in hand. And they did not believe me because three weeks in, they still had only got coppers off me. And I said, look, you're getting fed. You've got a roof over your head if you want to doss down here. But I can't pay you yet. Stay with me, believe in this, you'll get your money. The crew was getting smaller and smaller and smaller. How many people did you start with and how many did you end with? Crew, I remember, I could be wrong here, of about 30. I think there were seven at the end. And did that include you? Yeah. I was doing the camera, I was doing the lighting, I was doing the sound. I was doing the bloody catering. What soils my memory of the production, um, and it always comes back to me, is the well, it was the combination. It was the combination. It was the combined drinking and love making at all hours, which really did, I thought, insult my intelligence, because I wasn't. I'm not run. I wasn't running a circus in my book. I wasn't running a circus. I wasn't running some shoddy cowboy outfit. And at times... I'm sorry you think that. Well, you and Dean were seen on set naked. And photographed that way. I don't remember that at all. No, you don't I, remember that. I don't, you know, I mean, I don't doubt that. Dean don't remember it either. But it's on film. There was a lovely little thing called, um... Tika, was she called? She had a twin sister. Um, beautiful girl that uh, I got actually confused. And because uh, the way that the actual caravan was, there was two doors. I was in one side, Dean was in the other. And uh, drink had flowed, and I didn't know whether it was Tika or her sister had gone in one door, come out the other. Dean had gone in one door. Tika had come out. I'd gone in the other. Absolute mayhem. But such good fun. I've, you know, I think at an early age it's important to tether your beast. Otherwise it can run riot. And in the days of Dark Place, I have to say, Todd, you and Dean ran right. Well, let me say one thing about that. I would say, a man who behaves like a beast shall never suffer the pain of being a man. Yet a man without love is like an orchard without cherry blossom. That's the way I feel about it now. I've mellowed, I think. We have restored Dark Place to as near its original condition as we can get it. But a lot of the film is lost in the Thames. There was a police raid on my house and I had to get rid of certain articles sharpish. In that mix-up, I ended up dumping half of Dark Place in the bottom of the Thames. There's no going back from that. Um, I apologise to Garth. He understood. He's a good friend. But this is partly why we're yakking so much in this, just to fill up the bloody time. The editing was done in the old way, on an old flatbed editing thing, which is why it sometimes jumps around. Mm. Because once you cut, you cut. And we cut with scissors, and we just threw the stuff away that we didn't want. So sometimes we cut it, throw what we thought we didn't want away, and just think, oh, we could have used that, but by that time we'd scrapped it. Or it was oh. covered in beans or something, you know. I 
I never really saw myself as an actor. Um, I had acted at school. I played a shepherd in the nativity play. Um, I, the year after that, I played one of the kings in the nativity play. Garth's not bad. You know, he could have gone on to do other things, possibly. I don't think he's that interested, but, uh, you know, he seems to, you know, remember his lines, which I suppose he should do as he, you know, as he wrote them that morning. I do tend to, um, you know, do a little bit of Stanislavski on. Have you heard of him? Stanislavski and Psycho Technique. Do you know what that means? I do that. Two takes, yeah. If you can't, you know, basically nail the thing in two, you know, then you're, you know, pissing in the wind, I think. If you can't get it in one take, then you're not an actor, in my opinion. It's an odd one. Dean's not an actor. But I told him at the time, I didn't want an act. Don't, not interested. I want the truth. Dean's one of the truest people I've ever met. He will not lie to me. Um, so I just wanted that. I wanted to capture him. As far as I was concerned, he's my boss of sorts. I didn't... I, I, it was more about not wanting to have anyone else as my boss who wasn't... who I couldn't trust. I don't like... I don't like being bossed. I don't like having a boss. And I knew that if I cast anyone in the role of Thornton Reed, I'd probably sack them within a couple of weeks because they'd just rub me up the wrong way. Dean had never acted. Now, I know Dean. I mean, I, I'd known Dean for uh, uh, a fair few sort of years before we actually did this. Uh, he never spoke about, you know, sort of wishing to act. It was just about saving money. Um, yeah, Dean had never acted at all. I remember on the first day that we got there, um, we had to, you know, do some sort of camera tests. And, uh, first thing, Dean would do this. It would be a case of, of him going, can you see what I'm doing there? Now, just by blinking of the eyes, I'm making myself weaker. You see, as an actual performer, one is much weaker, you know, when blinking the eyes. So I said, Dean, stop. Think about next month's rent. Think about your tax bill, you know, trying to bring the guy down. Straight away he got it. Any emotion you care to mention, I can do now, thanks to Mr Todd Rivers. It comes from his shoes, comes from his feet, yeah, it comes from rhythm. If I were to do terror, it's not too much, you see. Because before, with terror, I'd be going, that's too much, that camera's like a bloody magnifying glass. Um, you can see everything, you can see thought. Uh, so you're in for a treat, um, hope you can't, um, but it can actually. I like his vacancy, I like it. I think there's a rawness to it. It's almost like he's made a pact with Lucifer, you know, and Thornton Reed, I think if the series had gone on, we would have discovered how Thornton Reed had kissed the bottom of Lucifer. I'm a great believer in Garth's writing, and so I didn't want to do too much with the words. And Todd was saying, perhaps I was doing too little with the words. And I thought, all right, I'll take that on board. And so, you know, if I was picking up the phone, instead of just going, good morning, which is how I started off, I go, good morning. You know, just give it a, a little bit of something. How do you pick up the phone at Beelzebub's? Hello, Dean Lerner. Is uh, how I pick it up. If I'm at Beelzebub's, because it's important to give a good... Um, it's important to give the customer confidence. And so I will pick up the phone and use a bit of a voice. So you're an actor when you're a publisher. So I'll pick up the phone and go, Hello, Dean Lerner. How might I help you? Can I interest you in a book? Which one would you like? So that's two books on, on their way to you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. And that makes them feel that they're in safe hands because the guy's been courteous, he's got the two books that they had, that, that, they, that they'd wanted, and he's putting them in the post the next day in a brown paper envelope so that the wife doesn't see it. How would you answer the phone at home? Dean. I think, he, I think he actually could have made up a lot of those lines while he was going. I mean, it looks as if he did. Um, he's very good, though. He's not an actor, but, um, you know, not many of them were. Who are your main inspirations as an actor? As an actor? Um, Anyone from Star Trek, really? Uh, no. Well, I'm speaking personally. I'm, my great inspirations... I've always admired Chuck Norris. 
Um, but that's really... And I know that he's not a Shakespearean actor as such, but he was the chief inspiration for my action moments. He's a cinematic actor. But I really like the guy who played Maverick. What's his name? Garner. James Garner? A wonderful actor. Is, does he do the shampoo? Did he do Heart to Heart? Or was that Robert Wagner? He's good as well. I've um, always liked Mr T. Mr T, sadly, is no longer with us. I tried to put on Othello with Mr T, but he wouldn't get on a plane. I mean, he literally wouldn't... I thought it was just in the show, but he actually refused to get on a plane. No, that's true. I mean, they wrote He didn't call in. me a fool or ask for milk, but he wouldn't he was get very on a plane. Polite. He was very polite about it, not like B.A. Baracus, but he, he did refuse, you're quite yeah. right. He was a lovely chap. Really nice. Um... Bit too Christian for me. Yeah. And he's no longer with us. Or is he? I don't know. I think he maybe he's just ill. I did uh, Love Sabers Lost with um Peter Wingard. Uh who was in I mean he came to a sticky end, but um an incredible actor. You know, I would say as good, you know, as any, you know, of the big names. Gilgood, whatever. Um Wingard definitely had it. Right up to the end. What do you think about the theory that um, Dark Place was cursed? So you want to talk about the curse of Dark Place? Dark Place was cursed. I mean, I went bankrupt. Garth had a nervous breakdown. Todd became an alcoholic. I became very bitter of the, of the actual business itself after making Dark Place. That much is true. I suppose it did curse me, yes. I'm not really interested in the other supernatural nonsense you know, that may have arisen from the show didn't affect me don't care about things like that that's just a way of getting people to watch the show I've also found that out if you are an extra on a show or on a film you know the risks they know there's a risk that you might die that's why you get paid £80 a day you might die you probably won't die but you might What's probably going to happen is you're going to be 80 quid up on bunts. But you might die. Now, some of the extras on Dark Place died. But some didn't. They all got paid. Their families got paid. I waved adieu to everyone who passed away during the filming of this. With a tear in my eye and a song in my heart. But they knew the risks. We were using live physical effects... We were using flying knives that hadn't been blunted because they were straight from my kitchen. Their memories are with us. Not too well, but they're with us. There are some things you can't rush. With filming. Exactly. There are some things you've got, like you can't rush sawing. And you can't rush hammering, which we asked them to do. And so the turning point was the death of the grip. That's when we lost the crew. We had a flying bin, and that bin careered out of control... And it, I, I believe the word is brained. It brained him. Um, and we said, all right then, Colin, you have half a day off. Um, so out he staggered into the um, morning, bright as you like, and he walked into a bus. Now, did we kill him or did that bus kill him? I say it's the bus driver, but he got off. I had to go through the indignity of a manslaughter trial. Do I believe in the what? The horned one. The horned one? <laughs> what kind of nonsense is that? Do I believe in the horned... Do, do you mean do I believe in the hoof-footed one? Yes. Do you know? I think I do. I could see the darkness in her eyes. I knew that she'd... She'd done things with... the horned one. What sorts of things do you think she was doing? Well, I don't like to speculate as to what Madeline was actually doing. I do know that if you're a witch and you make a pact with Lucifer, you have to kiss his bottom. She would not learn lines correctly. She'd slip up. She would... Um, I'd find her nudging my arm accidentally when I didn't want it to be nudged. She wouldn't sit on Todd's knee. And, you know, after a while, you think, for God's sake, it's a joke. Just sit on the man's knee and he'll stop asking. I went into the caravan, to the sort of toilet cubicle, because I'd left my earring in there. And uh, she was in the shower. So I said, my dear, I I'm sorry, I've left, my I've left my earring in the shower. And, she of course, she was naked, so I turned round 
And uh, I turned back, and I shit you not, my friend, she was gone when I turned round again. So what would you say the message of Dark Place is? Keep making good television. You know, Dark Place is very, very good television. You know, storylines are bang on. Not bad acting. Um, yeah, you know, but they don't, you know, they don't want to make things like this anymore. I mean, I believe that the great shows have come and gone. TJ Hook has come and gone. Dukes of Hazard's come and gone. You know, Crystal Maze has come and gone. Um, we won't see shows like that again. Um, in our small way, I hope we're contributing to that canon. Um, it might be a niche market. Who knows? Who knows? I'm sure people would rather watch Big Brother, rather watch people shower. And I've, to be honest, I'd rather watch people shower than watch this. Simple storytelling. That's what's lacking now. That's what's lacking in cinema, TV programmes, TV, you know, expensive TV drama. Simple storytelling. Decent acting. Thought-provoking stuff. Art isn't a commodity that you haul in and out. No. Like dildos. Dark Place sums up television as we know it. By that I mean... To the untrained eye, everything looks smooth, hugely entertaining, everyone looks good, you know, everything is tied up at the end, yet the reality is far different. It was horrible to work on, I didn't get paid any money for it, and to be honest, I can't remember a thing about it now, and that's the way I hope it stays. Thanks very much. Because I will not pay a licence. I believe that the gift of Dark Place is a, such a sufficient gift to television that I don't believe I ever should really have to pay a licence again. I really don't. That's my gift. I've paid my licence a hundred times over with just one episode of Dark Place. So if they come, you know, jipping me for a licence again, up theirs. <laughs>